Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be in this beautiful world of ours. You have just landed on Ultra Life today. We are super excited today because we have someone that Ultra Botanica considers a dear friend of ours. Her name is Dr. Debbie Osmond. If you call her Deborah, she will think she is in trouble with her mom, so Absolutely. we're not doing that. But I'm one of your hosts. I'm Josh Bellew. I'm Adam Payne, and, and we are looking forward so much to uh, this interview. Deb, we've, we've had you before, and we've talked about so many interesting things. I am absolutely fascinated by your journey, how you got to from where you are in, uh, in your life to being one of the first, I think, A4M fellows, for that's the Aging and Regenerative Medicine Fellows that's, uh, that's a pra that was a practicing dentist. Were you one of the first? You know, who, who knows? Um, but it was a fantastic journey, and I thank you, Adam. I thank you, Josh, for letting me be here today. Um, it's, you know, when things just happen, you don't have a big plan, and you just sort of, like, fall down the mountain, and it's a wonderful ride. Uh, A4M was part of that. A4M was part of that whole thing. Do you mind, t before we get too far along into, or we're just starting here, would you mind giving us a journey? How did you even decide that you wanted to be a dentist early on in your life? Was there some sort of aha moment in your childhood? I know, like, you know, in kindergarten, we all played the game of, what do you want to be when you grow up? I wanted to be a fireman. And I actually, in six, in first grade, I wanted everybody to stop calling me Adam and call me uh, Fireman Joe. <laughs> and I great. asked my mom to write a letter to the teacher saying that they shouldn't call me Adam anymore, that my name was now Fireman Joe. And to our listeners, that was long before In Living Color. I just want to <laughs> let you know. So. <laughs> Thank, thankfully, my no, mom. Nothing to do with Jim. My Curry. mom waffled a little <laughs> bit around that request, and she said, well, no, we're not going to do that. But. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm kind of sad still about that whole moment that she decided not to entertain me on that fantasy. But what, what really, how did you even get into medicine and dentistry and, and that connection to integrative medicine? I'm, I'm sure there was a journey that happened in your life that brought you from being a little girl, wherever you were, to um, opening up those doors to the journey that brought you to here today. Well, I think uh, the first thing I remember wanting to be was actually a go-go girl. A go -go. Uh, yeah, because I wanted Nancy to have Sinatra era, I right? wanted to have boots with fringe, and oh, I wow. think that's when my parents both said Deborah, you know, and so <laughs> I was in big trouble. Uh, but then I wanted to be a basketball coach, so oh, wow. that was that was the next thing was a basketball coach. I was from a very sportsy family. Uh, my my parents were very young when I was born. My dad was actually still a teenager. And um, we all worked very hard with a lot of different part-time jobs. Where, whereabouts and was this? That was here in Oklahoma City. Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City. Wow. Yeah, I have so awesome what, parents. What were your mom and dad, what were they doing? Uh, my dad was working in a warehouse, and oh. he also had several part-time jobs, you know. And uh, my mom worked, and we. Uh, my dad worked in a grocery warehouse, Fleming, which is down the street, oh, in wow. fact. And he would bring home uh, bent cans. Right. And so we were excited. I mean, that was... That was great. <laughs> and so I, my parents just were so encouraging, and they said, you know, we, we want you to learn to work with your brain and not your back uh. in terms of physical labor, because my dad did a lot of physical labor. Um, so in, they were trying to the bless you, saying, they we don't were, want you to be cursed with having to do manual labor. Yes, anymore. yes. They really uh, blessed us. They uh, provided a strong faith in God. They uh, really told us, aim high, hit high. So my, I have one brother, wow. and they were just amazing when I look back and realize how young they were. But uh, then moving forward, I thought a basketball coach, and then I, I realized I probably wasn't uh, maybe mean enough for that. And <laughs> started taking uh, started taking science classes, and the, the counselor at the, at, at the co in college said, you need to be a physician. Well, I knew I also didn't want anybody to die. So oh, wow. I just thought, I'll be a dentist. I mean, one day I was literally like, I'll be a dentist. Didn't know anything about anything. Didn't know people generally were scared of dentists because I'd always had a, a nice dentist. And um, But anyway, that's how it happened. Do you think that was kind of a God moment in your life? That, that, that oh, absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Yeah, because I've loved it. I, I've, <laughs> I've loved being a dentist. Oh, and, that's so cool. And it's been a... Um, it's been so so big in terms of relationship, and, and relationships yeah. are what I like. If you, if you ever read reviews on, on Debbie, 
Adam, on when, when she had her full-blown practice on May Avenue. Oh, my gosh, you would think that these people were having her over to dinner at their house every Aww. night. They love her so much. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. <laughs> I true. love them. I love them. And um, so, and, and then it was like when our children were born, they went to work with me, and they would, Aww. you know, ride their tricycles down the hall, and people would come to hold a baby, and it, it's just been terrific, just terrific. Um, so, anyway, that's... and then that's so, so, that's how you became a dentist, but... Were this whole transition into integrative or functional medicine, what would you call yourself more an integrative or functional? Because uh, there are some people that uh, make distinctions around this. Yes, and I hear that distinction. I don't know specifically the, the distinction. Um, my training was, of course, in functional medicine. My retraining through the uh, through the Academy of Anti Aging Medicine. But I do integrate um, the best of both worlds. So from that standpoint, I'm, I'm looking at it as integrative, you know, integrating root cause medicine. And well, then sometimes we, you know, we integrate, you know, the, the best technology because I do saliva testing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of genomic testing. So that is absolutely integrating, you know, both, both, every every bit that helps the patient. So you, you, you're touching on, and Josh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm no worries. Uh, you're this whole thought of integrative medicine and oral health. It, this this idea got you a TED talk, right? And the, what yes. year was that? Uh, that was 2018. 2018. So if anybody's interested, we'll actually try to put a link in in the broadcast here, so that you can go to get a link to uh, Debbie's uh, face uh, Facebook TED talk. Um, because you, the title of it is absolutely, um, it, it draws you in and into a, a whole new set of concepts and ideas. And just for, for our benefit, what's the title? What was well, it? it's called The Forgotten Orifice. You know, so that's been pretty fun because it's not no the, doubt. people will say Think of the, other the orifice. missing orifice, <laughs> the, the lonely orifice, the hidden orifice, you know. I mean, I'm like, no, we're talking about the forgotten orifice. But that happened because... Um, through the fellowship, uh, yeah. they also offered a master's degree in metabolic nutrition. And, oh, interesting. And, and it was from a medical school. So um, I definitely, you know, was the oddball dentist in the medical school. And we had to write a series of case studies, like 27 case studies. And so every time I would incorporate actual patient experiences uh, and, and incorporate the, the saliva, the salivary diagnostics, testing oh, saliva to see what happened. S but, you know, in the medical school, even though it was an incredible program, they really didn't talk about the oral microbiome. <sighs> and so kind of as a, you know, maybe Well, that, that makes sense because doctors don't want to deal with teeth and the no. biome there. That's for them. It's the forgotten orifice. It is the forgotten orifice. I mean, we talk about all the other orifices, but right. um, so so I, as a joke, wrote my thesis and called it the forgotten orifice. <laughs> so the <laughs> dean was like, "Oh my gosh, we shouldn't have let you in, Debbie." You know, as a joke. <laughs> I mean, but but then then actually got a hundred percent on that oh, because wow. they were like, "This is a really great perspective." Sure. And um, it, it's one of those niches that you look at and you go, "Wait a minute, this is what they call a niche," and yet it's undiscovered country and there's millions upon millions upon millions of people that can benefit from what you have learned. So I go back to, I, I had some early experience in rheumatology, right? So, so my biotech career only goes back to 2004. Prior to that, I was a marketing geek. I did, in, I did a lot of work in management consultant and, and um, in the financial markets and manufacturing of all sorts of stuff. But then I got into biotech and one of the first areas that I focused on was rheumatology. And I remember some of these old school rheumatologists telling me that yep. before the age of biologics and DMARDs, which are disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs, we had a cure for rheumatoid arthritis. An 80% cure, they said. We would take out all the teeth of the patient, and in 80% of the cases, their rheumatoid arthritis would be resolved. Oh, Adam, it's, that's so interesting because Hippocrates, there's really? proof that he said that you would uh, cure arthritis by removing an infected tooth. And, and we actually have lots and lots of proof because now we can take out the, the fluid around a, a, an inflamed joint and we find Porphyromonas gingivalis. Oh my gosh. It is an oral pathogen that we can test for in the mouth. Now that's an interesting pathogen because it also causes lots of inflammation, chronic inflammation throughout the body, but it's also found um, 
often in the brain of people with memory loss. Yeah, and so. I want I want to catch you later on. Oh, that. There's, there's Some so of the many connections that you here. have mm-hmm. done there, mm-hmm. but I have to I have to when I first heard this from you, I was like mystified, upset, and frustrated all at the same time when you said, and I believe it's the bacteria you just mentioned, the Porphyrmorus. Gingivalis. Uh-huh. You can say it's Is PG. that the it's transmissible, kissable one? Transkissable. It's transmissible. Transkissable. transkissable. Okay. <laughs> it's so, transkissable. Yeah. By, yeah. by the oh, way, wow. you need to trademark yeah. that. Transkissable. <laughs> That's yours. Um, so, so this is an infection. So t- yeah, so tell it us is. about wow. that because I have tried to scared. share with my family and it's like the prophet is without honor in his hometown. They run me out. I'm like, guys, don't share your food. Don't drink from your straws from each other. You don't realize there's, oh, there's, you're just there's wor- major you're, you're bacteria much, that you can swap with much. one another. You're worried too much, Josh. Come oh, on. Of course I am. I'm the devil. Yeah. But really, this is a this is a transmissible issue between people. So it everybody is. has this then. Not everybody. No. no, 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 no. Of the people I test, and I test sick people. Uh, I would say only about maybe thirty percent have it. I, uh. I commonly. Uh, I mean, I see it in people with arthritic joints. I see it, you know, you see the cause. Um, I, I know you all interviewed Dr. Bargas, who is a recode doctor for mm-hmm. Oh, Dr. I love Bredesen. her. We love her. Oh, I love her, too. And, uh, you know, she sees Alzheimer's patients. Well, part of the Bredesen protocol is right. saliva testing because, you know, we're looking for... We're looking for not just porphyrmonas gingivalis, but also other inflammatory bacteria, these inflammasomes that um, they're considered to be red complex bacteria. And they go throughout the body. They can inflame the blood brain barrier. Uh, There's just, no, there's so much to talk about. And and to your point, Josh, you know, this, this might seem new, but I'll bet you that we have at our home 4,000 Re- peer-reviewed research articles in alphabetical order in different areas. Th- this is being researched all over the world, and to me, it really should be on the news. I appreciate you all having me because it's, it affects everybody. Everybody's so, got a mouth. So before news so alert. Before, so before Parfumonis people, is infecting thirty percent right. um, of the population. So, be, so before <laughs> people, people, so before people wow. get really concerned about this bacteria that they cannot pronounce. Would you tell them what you do? Because I saw you a couple of years ago, Debbie, and you just very methodically have this protocol. You have a toolbox. You give these brief explanations of what you're doing, why you're doing it. And then from there, can we go into some of these incredible things like the fusel bacteria and stuff and, and hit that? But I want people to realize there's really practical hope for what the information you're bringing to the table that doesn't have to be scary and it doesn't have to be a ton of money out of pocket either. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Uh, yes, and I don't want people to be scared because you know I don't know what percent it is specifically because I'm seeing sick people. So most of my patients are physician referrals or uh, referrals from those patients. So um, this bacteria uh, can be tested for we, it's a simple saliva test, just a swish test, mm-hmm. and we can find it, it's a qualitative and quantitative test. We can know if it's there uh, above threshold and and how high it is. So when we know specifically what we're dealing with, we can exercise precision medicine to to attack it. Um, So we're moving into a break right now. We're going to come back and we're going to move down this protocol that Debbie does that make, that simplifies and takes the mystery out of oral health, the, the gut connection to the mouth and how that works as well. You're listening to Ultra Life today. We're interviewing Dr. Debbie Osman. Do you want to get, get in contact with her? She's got a fascinating website. She does podcasts that's in 77 countries. She's just a sweet lady and it's a family affair with her and her husband, Mike. It's drdebbieosman.com. That's D-R-D-E-B-B-I-E-O-Z-M-E-N-T.com. D-R-D-E-B-B-I-E. O-Z-M-E-N-T dot com. This is Ultra Life Today. I'm Josh Bellew. I'm Adam Payne, and we'll be right back after this short message. Our mission is to take nature's most beloved botanicals and enhance them with our liquid protein scaffold technology. This helps it reach your cells faster and better. With exponentially enhanced bioavailability, you'll feel better every day. Ultra Botanica, the feel-good curcumin. 
Welcome back to Ultra Life Today. We're here with Dr. Debbie Osmond. And again, drdebbieosmond.com. Learn more about her. You are going to be fascinated at what you're going to hear in these next segments, not only about dentistry, but about Debbie's personal journey. You know, sometimes I think we think that phys physicians or medical people are just gods. They're people just like us. They go through life like we do, and they, they deal with stuff. And uh, fortunately, in Debbie's case, she she has a, uh, a, a really unshakable faith in her God that uh, uh, has really seen her through some interesting times. So you were telling us about this simple test that can be done. Um, how, what percentage of people when you test them start, you come back and go, I've got a plan for you. Here's what we can do. We can head things off at the pass. What happens? Well, Josh, of the people I see, I would say it's basically 100%. Wow. Because they are suffering from some kind of mostly a chronic inflammatory illness. And so oral pathogens are usually involved. I mean, they mm. really are. You know, we, we know the health, health starts in the gut. Yeah. But now we know the gut starts in the mouth. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, it's a tube from, you know, stem to stern. And um, <laughs> so we, you know, if we know what's going on in the mouth, some, I guess part of my early journey was um, realizing how much the mouth affected the gut was based on a physician who sent a patient Great who, story. who had high level of uh, fusobacterium nucleatum in their gut. She was testing it via a GI map, a stool test, wow. and couldn't get rid of it. And she would treat this patient. She, the patient would feel good for six months, and then it would come back. And was there a lot of rounds of antibiotics going on yes, in this? Yes, it was metronidazole, yeah, okay. which is flagell, mm. you which, know, over and over and over. so rough on, and, on, and they, on, on the entire microbiome. Yes, right? they would be so hopeful. Okay, I'm feeling better, and then it would come back. Yep. Well, once we realized, I mean, once we started connecting the dots, this is probably in, um, I'm going to say about 2015, maybe that fusobacterium was impacting the gut so uh, strongly that we, had, we knew we had to treat it in the mouth, get rid of it in the mouth, and then it could not recolonize in the gut. It's an fusobacterium nucleatum. So the, uh, so the vector for the, for the colonization of the gut came from the mouth. I, I know that there's also this commensal and commensal are the good bacteria, and we've we've um, we're pretty convinced, I think, medically that the appendix is like the reservoir for com good commensal bacteria. Right. So, can the mouth also be a reservoir of good bacteria for the body? Absolutely, Adam. And um, so, should we be swishing our mouths with good bacteria then on a daily basis? No, I, I think there's a lot to that. I think really, we've got a lot to learn. I think that's the new frontier of good oral probiotics that oh, absolutely put back good bacteria. And now Fusobacterium nucleatum is a bacteria, it's a commensal, uh -huh. and so everybody's got it, and when it stays at a happy level, it's not causing any damage. The problem is, you know, it can overgrow. I, I lovingly call that the mother-in-law bacteria, because, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm a mother-in-law, so I can speak to this. Um, if I don't stay too long, I'm the happy bacteria. So <laughs> so with Fusobacterium, if it, if it stays at a good level and doesn't, you know, doesn't take over and start moving things around, like your mother-in-law coming over and telling you what to do and uh, moving the furniture around and, and you know, changing your cabinets and all that and giving unsolicited <laughs> advice, then no problem. But when fusobacterium overgrows, it becomes a huge problem. Oh, wow. It is so commonly found. Now we know there's tons of research about how it potentially is the cause of colorectal cancer or one of the causes. Oh, wow. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a bridge bacteria. It's called a, a bridging uh, pathogen, and so it makes everything worse. It makes porphyrmonas gingivalis worse. So um, um, uh, there's also a fungal connection in the, in the oral cavity, too. So it's not just bacteria. There's, there are viruses. There are right. um, microorganisms, and there's um, fungus also. Right. Does, right. Does fu do, are there commensal fungi, or is, this, or is that just doesn't exist? I don't think I can intelligently speak to that yet. That's an area I actually had a, a long conversation with a a scientist yesterday, but I'm, I'm really? still learning. Yeah, 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 still learning about that. Uh, you know, of course, we know there's you know protozoa and fungi, and yeah. and it's got to be a happy environment. It's like a rainforest. So, you know, these things maybe aren't bad at low levels. Uh, it's just when they overgrow. So, like this, like this patient, you had this doctor send this patient to you, scratching their head because it was on again, off again with this high overload of this, of this uh, fusel bacteria. 
What did you do to treat it? How did you turn that around? And then how did you know you turned it around? So the way I typically treat things, I mean, sometimes I do use antibiotics. In right. that case, she'd had too many antibiotics. But uh, so I may do, uh, based on the symptoms, uh, if the physician has not yet taken a, a GI map or some sort of stool test, I might do that to see what the level is in the intestine. I see a lot of um, colon cancer patients. So when it's high in their gastrointestinal tract, we know we need to use um, an antibiotic to get rid of it there too. But I'll do like a laser cleaning, a deep cleaning, a very, in some ways, very standard of care. I mean, I have okay. my own protocol, but uh, get their mouth totally cleaned up, teach them that all bleeding matters, regardless of, of what they've been told or what they've experienced, because that's the evidence of infection, of okay. inflammation. So um, I'll get them cleaned up. We also do a 3D x-ray, a cone beam x-ray, to look for any hidden you know, focal areas of, of infection that are, that are also um, harboring these bad bacteria. Like, like an abscess of sorts. Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah, no, I like we have uh, one of our, our, our people that work here. She had uh, an abscess behind a tooth, uh -huh. and it was causing her immense ki uh, dysfunction and pain and sickness. And until she got the, the, that abscess cleaned out and they were able to irrigate it over and over again, she, w none of the symptoms were going away. So, I mean, that's kind of basic me me right. dentistry, right. right? But you're going to a level that's so much deeper. How do we mitigate these um, the porphyromonas infections that are in our in our body is is are antibiotics enough? No, never. Uh, it, I mean, if, if people are just thinking antibiotics are going to solve the problem, then we're right back to, you know, write a prescription and and move on. I mean, that may be necessary, but people have to change their. Um, eating habits, they have to change their uh, their whole life, their whole lifestyle. So it's all it's you know, it's, it's this whole environment that either is promoting dysbiosis, uh, gut, you know, total gut. Um, whether they're exercising makes a difference. Whether they're overweight makes a difference. You know, it all makes a difference. Their their um, their blood sugar. That's a mm, huge right. piece Right, insulin of it. resistance. Can insulin play. resistance to prediabetes, to full-blown diabetes. Uh, th the whole blood sugar dysregulation is actually a two-way street for these pathogenic bacteria and for gum disease. So, so, it, so people get overwhelmed. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the person that says, please right, right, give, right, right. give somebody a bite of apple and don't try to cram the whole thing down their mouth. You learned some things, Joe, along the way that are pretty practical and pretty simple related to supplementation, such as vitamin D. Help our people understand, because I actually mentioned this to my family, and my family had a revolution in the health of their mouth just by increasing their vitamin really? D Really? Just by vitamin D? Oh, Absolutely. great Listen point. This. This great point. Okay. I, I, I really like to understand the connection. This is a fan fantastic Because I've heard that most people are, are not, don't have enough vitamin mm -hmm. D in their body. Well, years ago... Um, I, I, you know, I had this family of patients and, um, and this woman that came in very regularly, a very uh, major executive in Oklahoma City, she kind of worked all the time. Uh, and she would always come in at two o'clock on a certain day and she would do everything I told her, but her gums never looked healthy. Mm. So I started seeing her like in 1986. And so this is probably, um, the year 2000 maybe. Uh, so I'd been seeing her for quite a while. She never looked healthy, but I knew she was doing everything she was supposed to do. She was very, very uh, structured about her life. So she comes in and her gums were so happy. They looked so good. And so I said, what are you doing differently? Oh, interesting. And she said, nothing. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. You were you're taking doing that for an answer, You're doing you? something differently. And she's like, Debbie, I'm thinking about it. And so we go over all this, and she's like, I can't think of anything. And I said, well, when you think of it, call me or, you know, I want to know. So literally she paid her bill, walked to her car, and walked back in. And she said, I've been getting a vitamin D injection. 
Oh, wow. Oh. So this was an epiphany. I mean, because this is probably around the year 2000. And so, oh, I started just, you know, looking up. I, I like, this is big. And in yeah. 2000, you were finding information, weren't yes, you? That I was, was just find, hidden yes. out there. It's 22 out there. years ago? It's out there, you guys. Yeah. It, you know, there's way more now. So, of let's, so let's, let's take a little step back because I, th I think a lot of people, they hear about vitamin D as a, this is a necessary thing we need to supplement with. But most people don't understand what and how vitamin D is functionally affects our bodies. Mm -hmm. Are, can you speak to the vitamin D axis and what it's doing? Vitamin D is actually a hormone. It's more of a hormone than a vitamin. Right. Okay. You know, our bodies are designed to produce it. So, of course, through sunshine. And that's the best way to get it, except it's hard to get it that way because you sort of have to be, you know, naked at noon and <laughs> have a high fence. Well. <laughs> to have, yeah, to have, and then be at the right latitude. So right. it'd be hard today. You know, we all wear coats in today. But. Um, so this is, a, this is a hormone that synthesizes really, through sunlight that hits our skin. Right. Right. And, of course, it's like everything else. As you get older, you synthesize less of it, oh my gosh. which is a problem. But it, every cell in your body has a vitamin D receptor. So it does all kinds. It helps everything else work. We have no idea right. how many functions so, so I've heard, it is affecting mm -hmm. in the so body. I, mm -hmm. I've heard it's that it ha more primarily more. has to do with the integrity of the cell membrane. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like, it's like a... a Bear, you know, it, it, it's the gatekeeper in a way of letting the good stuff in. Good, st I mean, that's part of it. That's just a piece of it. So, the so if we have good vitamin D levels, the healthier our cell membranes will be. Mm -hmm. And if we're lacking in it, it's going to. It means that our our cell membranes are going to get ratty. Right, it might right. be a, not a great analogy, but or won't be healthy. Permeability, the structure and the strength of the cell membranes. Guess what, guys. Being given that each one of us is a community of 13 trillion cells, I think it's pretty important for us to have good cell membranes. Mm -hmm. so, so you made this vitamin D connection. Now, where did that lead you from there? I mean, it's like, what a discovery. And here that was 23 years ago. Well, and she you're could see it. You're digging around. She right? could, she yeah. could she see it. She saw the cause and effect. So, you yeah. could see it yeah. in this person's so, so mouth. So how did you take that information and then begin to implement that in your practice? And what did you begin to see? So I started you know, telling everybody. Um, because, you know, having this relational practice, sort of a boutique pra practice, uh, I had plenty of time to talk to people, and I would just say, hey, here's what I've been learning about vitamin D. Have your vitamin D tested, and then here's the level we want to get it You're doing your own case studies up. right in your yes, own backyard, right? You're seeing it. And so then, I don't know, you know, you read about one thing, and then, then I started learning about probiotics, oh, digestive probiotics. And so as I wrote prescriptions... Um, I always had them go at that point to to the health food store and get the refrigerated probiotic because, you know, that's the best I knew about at the time. Sure. But would talk to people about that. Well, those, the, those at the time were the highest quality ones that yes. were preserved in a chilled section of the health food mm -hmm, stores, mm -hmm. right? Because um, most people don't understand these are living cultures, right? right. And you can't just put them into a, into a capsule and, and expect them to survive. You really need to refrigerate them just like yogurt or any other living being or living organism. You need to take care of them. And, and we yes. become the host for these yes. bacteria, yes. essentially. You know, um, I, I did a lot of work in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, yes. rheumatology and, and IBD yes. and IBS a little bit. And one of the interesting rabbit holes that I went down was, under, was understanding that the mucin that our colon makes is actually the food that the bacteria in our yes. gut eat. Yes. And so we're actually, f there. we are farmers of good bacteria. And oh. having healthy mucin is actually creates healthy farms for these bacteria. And when they eat our sugars, which is these mucins are made yes. out of, and actually they, in they, in they integrate those sugars into their, into their membrane. So like gram negative in, uh, bacteria that are good bacteria in our gut are actually covered in the same mucins that we produce. Yes, yeah, there's a bacteria that we look for in the GI map called Acromancia mucinophilia. And, uh, Say that 10 times. Uh, yeah, I know, but it's a bacteria. <laughs> she can do it. The bottom line that, you know, you can look and see what you've got going and you mm. can see, you know, how to remediate, you know, what you need to. And it's not always um, something you put in, it might be something you start leaving out. Interesting. You know. so, um, uh, so how do we help, how, 
what strategies are available besides, you know, the machine guns of antibiotics? What role does nutrition play or um, good oral health? I mean, so some people need intervention, mm -hmm. like right. scaling and root planing, right. because the, um, the, their mouth is just not a good environment. It's not a good farm for healthy bacteria. How do, what can, what, what suggestions can we give to people how to approach this, this concept of oral health and uh, in, into usable terms. Okay, this is a perfect segue into a break, you guys. Oh, I hate, we're going to have to wait. interrupt this lively this dialogue. Is gonna, people are going to have to wait for a week, Josh. They are. You're oh, listening man. to Ultra Life today. You're going to wait a week to get the, uh, uh, the next segment of this, but we're going to have the fun of uh, talking to Debbie behind your back. Until then, uh, I'm Josh Bellew. I'm Adam Payne, and this is Ultra Life Today. <laughs>